Samantha. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you, Glenn, Ronnie, Annie. Any other E's? Thanks to everybody for having me. Thanks to my folks for coming down, my sponsor and my best friend and friends and my family and my Dodson and all oh, Thanks, thanks, thanks. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, it's an honor and a privilege. It's great. Honor and privilege. I love it. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Jonathan, great job. What he said. Happy birthday, all you cake whores. I love it. Awesome. Welcome to the new people. Can the new people, people in the 30 days, can you please stand up, please, really quick? Come on, we don't have time. Do it. Do it now. One. That a girl. Fucking get some balls. Stand up, stand up, and stay up. Just follow some direction for a fucking change. One, two, three. What about out there? Give me a hoot. Any newbies out there? There you go. Okay, now sit. How many relapsers? Stand, please. Relapsers. Let's go. Stand up. Relapsers. Now raise your hand, you fuckers. Stand up. Do it. I got a point. That's a girl. Proud. Loud and proud. So, for those of you who think that relapse is not a part of recovery, I'm just saying. For us. For us, it is. My sponsor here, so I wasn't going to use any fucking profanity, but obviously. <laughs> Where's Tom with 20 years? Right here. What's with the 20 bucks, bro? <laughs> I'm just saying, it ain't my meeting. I'm just kidding. <laughs> my sobriety date this time is September 5th, 1995. I have a sponsor. She has a sponsor. She has a sponsor. I did not stand up and take a kick because I am broke. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> But I blew like 60 bucks driving out here, so that's my donation. <laughs> like I wouldn't have driven this far for a drink. Come on. Um, but anywho, <laughs> my home group in Santa Barbara is off center on Sunday mornings. My home group in Phoenix, Arizona is the 4848 Women's Stag. 48? That's on the tape, ladies. <laughs> what else? <laughs> I'm tired already. I'm scared and tired. I'm sad and afraid. <laughs> Let's get out the disclaimers right now before I start going into an area where all the newcomers are like, what the fuck? I don't want anything. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love that recipe right there. That recipe works perfect. It works perfectly. So if you're a relapser and you're one of those relapsers, like, I don't know what happened, man. I was doing all the deal. I was doing the whole deal. I was going to meetings. I was reading the big book. I was hitting my knees. I was praying. I was having commitments. I had a sponsor. I was working the steps. I was speaking. I was like, hey, whoa. That's not true. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I could be wrong. But my experience is, and I'll share my experience, which is my opinion, which is based on my experience, which means if you want to go outside afterwards and talk about my opinion, I will win because it's my experience. I got the scar tissue to prove it. So let's just like breathe that in for a second. People come up and just like, well, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm relapsed as part of recovery. Shut the fuck up. In a nice way, that's probably what I'll try to say is, well, you know, if, you know, if I don't really know you, I'll be like, well, okay. But if I know you, you, well, you, you wouldn't even say that. So I don't know. Sobriety days before this September 5th. Uh, what do I go to? 25 after? Right. 29 after. So here's the deal. This is a recipe that works perfectly. This is not a program for people who want it. This is not a program for people who need it. This is a program for people who do it. That's it. Sorry. <laughs> Here's some more bad news. I'm the demotivational speaker for tonight. Let me just tell you that right now. <laughs> this program has nothing to do with drinking. <laughs> this program has nothing to do with drugs and alcohol. It's much scarier. <laughs> but I digress. Anyways, so what happened? What it was like? Blah, 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 blah. So I'm adopted. I'm the only one that was adopted. Uh, I'm the youngest of four kids. Uh, I don't know. I was touched inappropriately when I shouldn't have been. Uh, all that 
shit that I thought made me an alcoholic and then I got here and everyone took my story because it's like, oh, you know, I never felt I belonged to. Well, aren't you adopted? No. Oh, shit. You know, and then the whole, you know, I was raped 16 times. Oh, shit. I was only raped once. Okay. Well, yeah, so that card's got to go. And then I was raped by my dad. Oh, I was only raped by my big brother. Well, I wasn't really raped. It was a game we plugged called Slave Girl. It didn't hurt. I don't know. I didn't even know. story because I didn't know that I didn't know that I could come to Alcoholics Anonymous and I could make a new story I had no idea I thought that it was my story it's my baggage it's my luggage it's my who I am I'll be the hole in the donut what will I be without my story and it's old it's like I'm tired and I keep living like a victim or living like a victimizer I keep living that role I keep choosing those people I keep spray painting my red flags green I keep going into that area where it's like you know well it's the best job ever because it's the most money I've ever made you know I just bust out the green spray paint can and go shh because the minute that I shake the guy's hand my gut's like whoa right but I just go shh because that's the most money I've ever made. Or I meet the guy, you know, the guy, and it's like he's got issues with his mom or whatever, but I'm going to change him, you know what I mean? Because he hasn't met me yet, you know. And uh, so I just bust out the green spray paint can, and I find that somewhere in the past I've made decisions based on self, which later put me in a position to be hurt. I stepped on the toes of my fellows, and they retaliated seemingly without provocation. <laughs> So I'm an alcoholic, not because of how much I drank or whatever, but it's because of what it did for me. That's why I'm an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic because most non-alcoholics drink, get drunk, have a good time, have a bad time, whatever. 99.9% .9 of the time they end up in their own bed and they go to something called a job in the morning. <laughs> quite foreign to me, some, even in sobriety. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> what makes us different, what makes me different is I have a few drinks, could end up in my own bed, could end up in Atlanta, Georgia, you just don't know. And um, it's a crapshoot, it's the roll of the dice, it's the roulette, it's, you know, because I have this, this dual thing going on, which is I have this obsession of the mind and, and then I have this allergy of the body. And the way this allergy seems to manifest itself is in this thing called a phenomenon of craving. A phenomenon, which means you can't understand it. So don't try to fucking understand. You're like, a phenomenon, I gotta understand. I gotta wrap my arm around. Like, the doctors can't wrap their arms around it. That's why they call it a fucking phenomenon. So just breathe that in. <laughs> we don't get it. It's weird, wild, wacky stuff. It's like the mystical force that removes one sock from the dryer. That's that. It's just like, what? That's the allergy. That's the weird, wacko thing. That's the thing where I'm sitting at the table, and I'm not even drinking, but someone I'm with is drinking, and they're, they've had like two sips in 45 minutes, and I'm like, what the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? Drink it, drink it, drink it, drink it, drink it. I make my mom, my 84-year-old mom, a cocktail every night, right? And for years and years and years, she's always had wine. She always has Merlot. So I, you know, and I, whatever. You always want your alcoholic daughter to make your cocktail, trust me. But anyway, it's like you want the speed freak to make the coffee at the workplace, you know? I mean, I want to be able to feel like I have to go to the bathroom while I'm smelling it. You know, like I have to run to the bathroom. That's, if you don't know speed, then don't worry about it. Just roll with it. It should, you should have to really go. And, um, am I right? Yeah. Come on. I don't 
try to teach my clean, you know, just anyways. So who, uh, so, but, but we ran out of Merlot one night, a few months back, and so all we had was whiskey in the house, you know, whiskey from like, I don't know, 62 or something, I don't even know how long I was in there, but anyway, so I pop for a whiskey, you know, and I, I fill, fill the glass up with ice, fill it to the top with ice, trying to be responsible, because I don't want to start, you know, because I'm the one that's got to pick her up, so I fill it with, and then I just go one, two, three, four. Pretty good, right? So, but sometimes I start talking. <laughs> and I'll be like, one, two, I'll get that. Let me get that. Put that down. Whoa! And then the cat is like, you know, and I got it all over my cat the other night, which was so funny because he was like licking it. And I was like, go, oh, dude. So that's, you know, people are <laughs> trying to feed my dog Goldschlager. Just, they, they're not into it at all. But, um, so I pour this whiskey, and the next morning I said, how was that? And she's like, when I went to go get her wine and she's like no I think I'm going to stick with the whiskey because I slept all through the night I'm like you go girl so now I just enjoy it I just you know I like the whole I like watching people drink I like, you know, so I'm still a celebratory kind of person you know because alcohol has never been the problem alcohol is not bad you know I'm kind of one of those people that like God's in everything or God's in nothing you know what I mean that's just me I think God's in methamphetamine I think God's I think God's in everything it's just where I get involved that we lose the connection. So, anyways, that's just me. Why do we go there? I don't know. Let's just go for it, okay? So, um, so I got loaded late in life. I was nine. I was in fourth grade. Like I say, I could have used a drink a lot sooner, but it was hard to score with it, like a Partridge Family lunch pail. <laughs> So my first drink came disguised in the form of skunk bud, and, and, and I was at Lisa's house, and she had older brothers that dealt, and they loaded up that bong, that beautiful bong, and just, uh, you know, um, you know, just, and the smoke curled up this big, gorgeous thing, and he cleared that chamber, and I was like, Wah! and I was in, and I hadn't even had any, and I was in, I was in for the experience, and I remember smoking pot that day, and falling off their roof, and eating a lot of almond milk and candy, and I couldn't <laughs> wait to do it again, and that was my first drink, and I, I talk about drugs because that's just, you know, if you're a purist, <laughs> too bad, you fucking missed out, so, um, <laughs> You try eat because you'll just, I don't care how old you are. <laughs> and frankly, I think if you can put it in a syringe, it deserves to go in your body. That's just me. So, but, so I, you know, I honor all the 12 step programs. This is the program that I come to because, you know, I put gin in a syringe that's stuck in my arm. You know what I mean? That's just the way I roll. And so it's like, why? Why don't you drink it out of a glass? It's like, because I had a perfectly good syringe. You know, some people just don't understand that, and that's okay. Um, but that's me. So, um, so I was nine years old, and things pretty much went downhill from there. <laughs> I was in my first drug rehab at 17, where I got the message of hospitals and institutions. Whoop, whoop. And uh, the only thing I remember about that first meeting is that maybe I was sick and not bad. <laughs> And for me, that was something, because I was a child that was an evil child, I was a bad seed, I was, you know, the one that would obsess about dropping acid in my mom's coffee and just watching her flip out. I mean, that's all, I mean, I had a, I had a death plan. I hated my mom and dad. I mean, you feel me, dog? I hated them. And... I hated God, no problem with God, knew there was one, hated him, next. Um, and the whole thing about, so when I get this program, I'm, I sponsor a lot of women that every now and then they make one mistake and one mistake only, and they only make it once, which is, you know, well, I deserve to be happy. You know, I deserve a good relationship. I deserve a car. And I'm like, bitch, you deserve to be locked up for the rest of your life. <laughs> justice here? You want what you deserve? Do you want the punishment to match your actions? Do you? I want 
mercy. I'm not into justice. I'd rather have mercy. That's why we say where I'm from, I'm glad I get what I get and not what I deserve. Now, I realize that that may sound like some sort of a self-defeating, low self-esteem. That's not what it is. What it is is it keeps me in balance and it keeps me in perspective because I have a horrible disease of a sense of entitlement. I mean, you know, going through that fourth step was like pulling teeth for my sponsor probably the first time because when it came to the fourth column, it was just like, <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> You know what I mean? She's like, well, why don't we start with expectations? You know, and I'm like, expectations? Well, I expect brothers not to touch their little sisters on their vagina. She said, yeah. I said, what the fuck? (laughs) And she said, what's reality? And I was like, ah. Reality is that they do that. So what is your resistance to reality? It's like, oh, let me count the ways. You know what I mean? Methamphetamine, hallucinogenics, whatever, you know. So anyways, the recipe works perfectly. We think it's best if you're starving because the meal that the recipe produces is rather distasteful. (laughs) Who cares to admit complete defeat? Practically no one. Who cares anything about turning their will and their life over to the care of some god that never did them any favors? Who wants to write a list of their grosser handicaps and then share it with some stranger who's just going to talk shit about you at the next meeting. <laughs> character defects? You want my character defects? Oh, you mean my survival skills. <laughs> Who wants to stand in front of the judge and say, I did it? Uh, Ms. Paterna, you were just here uh, last month. What are, you, what, are you, what are you doing back here? Well, I forgot to tell you that um, I used my sister's name when the last time I got caught shoplifting, and now there is a warrant out for my sister who's like a born-again Christian, which she'll probably flip out if she gets the whole, ooh, you know, when she's driving through the Inland Empire to go get apples or something. So I thought, I'm 14 months sober, I thought maybe I should take care of that too. And here's the thing. If you're standing in front of the judge, this you want to blow his mind. Like, just shut that guy up. Because all day long, he's been hearing, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. And he said, well, what do you think we should do about this, Matron? And I looked at him and I said, whatever you think's best, Your Honor. And he was like, had, like blew a gasket. He was like, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, uh. <laughs> he throws it, referred to on-site probation, you know. And then I talked to the probation guy and I got the letters from the people that say I'm not that way and I got a job and all this other, blah, 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 blah. I go back in front of the judge and the judge's like, what are we going to do? And the probation officer goes, um, two days probation, $600 fine. And he just looks at me. And this is like my fourth petty theft. I should go to jail. I should, whatever, whatever should be happening. I don't know. And um, he says, he looks at me and he goes, well, there must be some extreme extenuating circumstances. And the probation officer goes, there are, Your Honor. And so he goes, so order. And that was it. Now, I'm just saying that you'll, you may also have the experience I had at 16 months sober, which was, I guess me and God are going to jail. <laughs> so don't just think that if you stand in front of the judge, you ain't going to go to jail, because Sam said she didn't go to jail. I did go to jail. And I got the, the electronic monitoring thing, and it was cool. It was trying to match that with all your outfits and stuff. But anyway, I tried to have, you know, tried to have sex with that. We were like, you know, in, in, in your first year, you know, or something. And you're just like, I know, you know, the guy's, you know, some guy, whatever you pick up or whatever. I mean, maybe it's just me. But anyway... It's like, oh, I wish I had shaved and I wish I didn't have this thing on my head. <laughs> now that's actually what keeps me from having sex. Well, also that really I'm completely shut down in that. I think, I don't know, what year does that the hymen grow back? What year does that happen? Because I'm like, no. I think that, that's on its way there. And I'm good with that. So I'm going to share something with the ladies, some of the guys have got too, but I'm going to share this with you guys because this is really going to blow your eye. <laughs> I'll get that get to that later. So anyways, so who wants to stand for the judge giving back their money? Then of course, not, you know, 10 is the kicker. Who wants to, you know, make amends, which is not I'm sorry. It's I was wrong. And last year when I came here, I said uh, there's not there's nowhere where it says say you're sorry in the big book and in, in the ninth step and the tenth step. I mean, it says in the ninth step, but not in the tenth step. And one of the guys came up to me afterwards, and was like, it does say that. And I said, oh shit, I was wrong. And then I went immediately to the book, of course, and he was wrong because it doesn't say that in the tenth step. In the tenth step, it's just like I was wrong. 
if you don't think there's a difference between I'm sorry and I was wrong, try I was wrong. Because they've been hearing I'm sorry for years. I'm sorry. I'm, so, I'm sorry. 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 I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> over it. They don't want to hear I'm sorry ever again. They want to hear I was wrong. What can I do to make it right? And then 11, of course, who cares anything about prayer and meditation, which is like for the big kids, you got to have a coach because you can't sit for, you know, one minute and be quiet, you know. And then the kicker, who, can, who wants to sacrifice time and energy carrying the message to some other ungrateful broad who's not going to stay sober anyway? That's my paraphrase. And the 12 and 12 says, no, the average alcoholic self-centered in the extreme doesn't care too much for this prospect unless he has to do these things in order to stay alive himself. I was eight years sober before I got alive. I thought it said sober. <laughs> alive. Which, of course, prompts the question, what kind of death are we talking about? You know what I mean? Because if it's quick death, you know, I'd be like, death, you know, choose a spiritual life or die an alcoholic death. And only us were like, wait, don't rush me. Hang on. Wait. <laughs> spiritual life, alcohol. What kind of death? Instead of bloody death? What kind of death? So, the death I'm talking about is like this slow, drawn out death. And for me, it's icy shark infested waters. Because for me, it's the, when I was four years sober, my sponsor said, I want you to pick the most long, drawn out way you can think of to die. And I don't know, call me dramatic. But um, I was thinking icy, cold water where your heart slows down, it's harder for you to bleed out, blah, blah, blah. You, you know, the ship's going down, and uh, there's this little, you know, tug on my foot where the shark doesn't take my foot, but there's blood going in the water and then there's more sharks in the water and then you're getting pulled and tugged and you're completely conscious because you can't bleed out and you can't go unconscious and so then which says you know uh, many of these last gaspers had a hard time you know accepting how hopeless they really were but when they you know accepted this and sort of seized hold of this AA principle with all the fervor passion with which the drowning sees life preservers in icy shark infested waters they almost invariably thought well it's like yeah no shit you know because now you want to see me swim for the life preserver I'll be like fuck you Glenn <laughs> so people are like oh my god Sam's your sponsor oh god what a Nazi what a, what a big book thumper like there's some other book I'm supposed to be thumping but anyway you know and, and so I just say look man I see shark infested waters that's just that's my experience because here I am at 17 years old I get sober for a little bit I go back out get sober again at 20 stay sober for six and a half years and then I quit going to meetings which is the five most infamous words I hear from relapsers I hear five things the most I quit going to meetings I didn't do a fourth I didn't do a fifth I didn't do a ninth and I didn't do a twelfth I got six, six seven years sober I got nothing to give I don't know and I, that's when my compassion sounds like a load shotgun. It's just like, shh, shut the fuck up. You know what I mean? Because that's the dope. That's the whole dope. That's like the bag of shit. That's like the killer, I don't know, 12-year-old scotch. It's whatever. It's like, that's the thing. And so the first year of sobriety, all we're trying to do for the newcomers is just like keep them distracted. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I don't know, clean up the ashtrays. Uh, uh, I don't know, clean up the chairs. Uh, you know, help me wash my car. Uh, you know,
You know how many times I say to people, did you pray? Oh, I know it's all going to work out. That's not what I asked you. I asked you, did you pray? You know, we're really big on that whole spiritual talk and that whole prayer thing. But did you fucking pray? (laughs) Try that. I don't know how to pray. Well, that's funny because right here it says praying only for knowledge of his will and the power. That's a great place to start. Pray only for that. Anything after only, do that. And if they're in the big book and it says only if you do this will you get that. That means only if you do this will you fucking get that. Everyone's like, this is for fun and for free. Bull fucking shit. This program, you pay, motherfucker. You pay. Go through the big book and the 12 and 12 and just circle anytime it says only until or unless. Unless you have this, you can't have this. Until you do this, you can't have this. We can have this provided we do this. It is condition of the wazoo, that book. If you want what we have, and, here's another fucking part, are willing to go to any lengths to get it, that's a two-parter. How many people just skim past the most important word in the promises? If you're painstaking. What's that? Painstaking. Or pains taking. Got that? We're going to go through some fucking pain. Because we've been avoiding it forever. I get a little passionate about that. <laughs> So I'm six and a half years sober. I quit going to meetings. I'm at the bar with my husband and my girlfriend who had never seen me drink at the time. It's always classic to be with non-alcoholics and tell them you're a recovering alcoholic because they're like, that's terrific. That is so neat. That is really special. You must be really proud. They totally don't get it, you know. They got it that night. So they're talking, yakking, whatever, whatever. I've been thinking, because the disease rests in your mind, not in your feelings. We don't give a fuck how you feel. I know it sounds like we do, and there's lots of people in here that do. I don't. I don't care how you feel, because I know that's not the truth. The truth is, what are you thinking about? And here's the one character defect. I'm just going to cut through all the bullshit here. And if you haven't gotten your seventh step, then just close your ears, or I don't care what you do. But anyways, there ain't 1,600 different character defects. There's one. It's just, it's fear. Fear is the evil and corroding thread the entire fabric of our existence is shot through with it. It dresses up in all kinds of sweet outfits, and the longer you've been sober, the cuter they get. Let me tell you that. (laughs) And I never get nailed by one. I like a gangbang by character defects. I'm like, cry, fear, lust, ugh, you know? It's never just one at a time. You just get boom, boom, boom. (laughs) But it's always fear. Just give me any emotion you have that isn't peace, and I'll trace it to fear. Envy, that's fear. Greed, that's fear. Lust, that's fear. Pride, that's fear. Dishonesty, that's fear. I'm not enough. I'm too much. It'll never. I'll always. Fear, 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 fear. Fear. Fear for me comes from being disconnected from you. It comes from being disconnected from my creator. And my creator lives in between you and me, in the space in between you and me, in the space in between me and me. That's where my God is. And if I'm off the rope, I'm off the GPS system. My God is a very polite God. Okay? My God is not a Santa Claus God. My God does not do anything. Sorry, that's way too advanced for some people. But anywho, we'll just go back to the like basic. But God is not something outside of me that lives on a throne and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and you and hear people with tons of years sober say, I don't know why I've been so blessed. I don't know why I got it and he didn't. It's like, shut the fuck up. Are you kidding me? You got it because you said thank you that day. He didn't because he said no thank you. Very simple. Thank you for the gift. No thank you. You don't get it because of any other reason. Or what the whole fucking thing about grace? What's the grace thing about? Isn't that undeserved merit? You get it because you're a piece of shit. Breathe that in. It's beautiful. (laughs) The book says all-time losers. We're all-time losers. What are you, the kind of person that gets a few years sober?
over and all of a sudden it's like you got to put this hand sanitizer on all the time. And it's like, bitch, I used to get toilet water in my syringe and now I, I have to take vitamins. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm just saying. Which I do. But you see how we get kind of elitist after a while. Who are you? I mean, alcoholic is not all of who I am. You know? I'm Samantha. In all of you, what all of it is. And I'm a mess. And I'm scared. And I'm grateful. And I'm beautiful. And I'm ugly. And I'm fat. And I'm thin. And I'm whatever. I'm all of that. And I'm a good daughter. And I'm a bad daughter. And I'm a great sponsor. And I'm a terrible sponsor. And I'm a great speaker. And I'm a fuck speaker. I do everything wrong. And I do everything right. Who are you? What lies are you believing about yourself today? Isn't it old? Aren't you tired of that shit that's running through your mind that tells you you're not enough? Man, it gets old and you know what? It gets in the way. So the prayer is the seven-step prayer. The prayer doesn't say remove my character defects. The prayer says take all of me. Just take all of me, good and bad. I don't even know what you should take. I might need that pride. Maybe I don't want that bitch to have more time sober than me. I don't know. I don't know what I need. You know what I mean? So I'm at the bar, and all of a sudden, the thought occurred to me, maybe if I put a little whiskey in the middle, I've got a full stomach, blah, 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 blah. Right? The thought occurred to me, I think, I think it was a phase. Because I was really young when I got so So I had a half a glass of white Zinfandel. It was silent, just like that, at the table. And then my girlfriend reaches over and goes, well, good for you. Yeah. Terrific. You showed me. Now, this is why I speak. Anytime I'm asked to speak, because this is a story I need to hear. That from the deepest part of my tummy, I heard a voice clear as day that said, here we go. And the next two years, I was arrested 11 times, put in five-point restraints, had my bottom teeth knocked out, and ended up in Atlanta, Georgia, because I'm an alcoholic who slams methamphetamine, which makes me a very busy alcoholic that gets nothing done. <laughs> And extremely scandalous in the process. And uh, so in August of 1995, after stabbing the man I loved because he was leaving with a full jar of peanut butter, I know that doesn't make sense now. It didn't really make that much sense then since I hadn't eaten since 1994. But anyway, <laughs> he had a strangling thing he had for me. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and I had always really judged women that were in abusive relationships because I was like, just get out. What's the problem with you? You give my gender a bad name. You just get out. You just leave. You just leave. You just leave. And I was thinking about that as he was strangling me. I'm like, hmm. And I went unconscious and wet my pants and I came back and he had this amused look on his face, sort of. And I thought, God, I wish I hadn't said that to Michelle because now I know why she can't leave. So the lesson was very clear that everything I judge, I walk through. And I have had that lesson in sobriety over and over and over. And now I'm a little more careful when I talk about who's getting divorced and who's fucking a newcomer and who's taking antidepressants and who's this and who's that. Because I'm thinking, you know what? I really don't have enough information to judge that. I really don't. It's none of your fucking business. If I come up here and I talk about it on the podium, I just made it all your fucking business, so shut the fuck up if you're talking about that stuff. We share in a general way. There's kooky people in these fucking rooms. You know, half these rooms probably you ain't even alcoholic. I'm just saying, there's a shitload of people that come into this program. You know why? Because the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. It takes a shitload more than that to stay. So I started working my steps, man, and I, I stabbed that guy and whatever, you know, the, the, the awakening, which was like, okay, what just happened here, <laughs> right? You had six and a half years sober, and now there's blood all over this guy's head is gushing out, and he's on the phone talking to the cops, so obviously he's fine. But, um, but it was a head wound, so it looks so bad. <laughs> Santa Barbara, whole point is walking up those stairs, Santa Barbara, hi, 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 my sobriety 
already started Casa Serena, and that's all there is to it. I work those steps like my life depended on it. Here's the first step. The first step is you're fucked. Let's move on. Okay? Let's just keep it simple. People that are working, I'm working my first step. I'm on my first step. I've read the first step. I'm doing my first step. What's to do? I mean, when the old timers wrote this book, we assumed you'd taken the first step before you got here. We're kind of like the all time losers club. What are you doing here if you're not powerless? So, lack of power is my dilemma. I gotta get some power. So, I'm, that's all step one is. You're doomed. Next. Step two. There's some hope in step two. Step two is find someone who's doing better than you are. And my sponsor had all her teeth, so that was it right there. She was doing better than I was. Step three is do what they say. Step three is where I live today, all the time. Step three is where I live. Step three is the realignment step. Step three is the practice, the practice, the practice, the practice, the practice, the practice, the practice. Whatever you want, God. Whatever you want, God. Whatever you want, God. Whatever you want, God. I have to do a sufficient step three. The entire rest of the program depends that I do that. And step four, step four is nothing, really. Step four is just like, bitch, wine, bitch, wine. I hate her, I hate her, I hate her. She didn't hug me. I hate her, I hate her, I hate her. It affects everything. And here's the deal. If it affects my self-esteem, I have a broken self-esteem. It affects my self-esteem, right? If it affects my self-esteem, what kind of security do you think I'm going to have? And ambitions. What kind of ambitions am I going to have with a broken self-esteem? Broken ambitions. What kind of security am I going to be able to provide myself if I have broken ambitions? Broken security. Broken pocketbook. If you think that's broken, what kind of people am I going to start depending on? What kind of personal relationships am I going to have? Broken. If you think those are broken, who do you think I'm getting into bed with? Broken. Need I say more? Boom. Just write all five down and move the fuck on. Your sponsor will help you work out the rest of that. <laughs> the sex inventory is whom did I hurt? What kind of harm are we talking about? Read is in the 12 and 12 about step eight. What kind of harm are we talking about? We're talking about instincts, God-given instincts, that somehow got polluted. They're in collision. All of a sudden, the need to take care of myself, which is a God-given instinct, starts to become an obsession, a total fear-based, you know, dilemma. And I'll tell you this right now, if you're trying to have an intimate relationship, you cannot protect yourself and be intimate at the same time. Breathe that fucking thing in. <laughs> you can't do it. You can't do it. And 9 and 10, as we went through all those things, and 12 is the dope, like I said. Here's the whole thing about my sobriety. My sobriety has been a constant rededication, a constant doing it wrong and coming back, a constant wanting to die and then glad I didn't do it. Constantly going, God, I'm so grateful I didn't kill myself. And that's what I'll think every single time anyone comes up to me tonight and says, thank you. I'll think, thank you, you're welcome. Because I learned how to say thank you and you're welcome. Not no problem, no worries, no big deal. You're fucking welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. It's an honoring, an exchange of intimacy, of connection. That's what my God is. And three years ago, I left my job and everything I was doing to go take care of my mom and dad, who are my heroes, who are 25 years in Families Anonymous, who are these black belt Al-Anons, to the bone, yay Al-Anon, saved my life. My dad who's my hero, would come to the door when I wanted to come for like a, I gotta wrap this up, for a shower or something to eat or whatever, I've been running the streets, and he would come and he would just walk to the front door in his bathroom and hold up an empty urine sample cup. <laughs> and I'd say, he'd say, get the hell out of here. And I know he would get into bed with my mom and they would hold each other and he would cry. And she would cry. But they had learned what it means to give their daughter the dignity to live or to die. That it was my life. But it was mine and my creator's. And that creator and I have had some fucking talks. I'd like to say that my surrender prayer was, please God help me. My surrender prayer in August of 1995 was, look motherfucker, if you're not going to let me die, then you help me stop wanting to. Now! Because I got another 40 years on this fucking planet and I'm not doing it like this. And the obsession was gone. Like, I don't know if I scared God. I don't know if I scared me. <laughs> and he was like, all right, little shithead. And I love so much. Boom, how's that? <laughs> Get sober and go fucking save some lives. Because that's what your job is now. And that's why lots of us go out. Because we can't stand the idea that we are truly divine. That we are truly saved for a way bigger purpose than what we think it is. And that I can hope you can stay on this 
planet and survive yourself long enough to find that out. And 90 days ago, right around now, man, I went to my daddy who's had dementia for the last 11 years, man. And the whole week before he died, I was just like, you can't go. You can't go. I'm not ready. You can't go. And he was so wanted to go. He so wanted to go. And the day before he died, I had some gnarly dreams that I won't get into, but basically I just went into the bedroom, I laid on the bed, I, I looked at him, I held his face in my hands, and I said, I know you want to go. And you can go. I'm more ready for you to go now than I ever have been. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And the tear fell out his beautiful blue eye. And about 11 hours later, I went in to kiss him. And that was it. And I laid down with him on the bed. He was so warm. I could have sworn he was breathing. I'm like, I think he's still breathing. And I just said, are you breathing? Are you alive? Are you alive? Are you alive? I called my mom in and my mommy laid down. And we laid on the bed with my dad for like two hours. And people started to come over and stuff. Uh, he was, he's the man that told me the words to live by. He said, baby doll, I just want you to be the kind of woman that, that can say shit when she steps in it and fuck when you're doing it. Don't you call it duty when it's shit. And don't you call it making whoopee when it's fucking. You say what it is. <laughs> Anyways, and the last 90 days have been like, and they are. We're riding the waves, man. I'm sad. I'm grateful. I'm angry. I'm happy. I'm blessed. I'm cursed. I'm whatever. I don't know. I'm 15 years sober. I've never been this old. I've never been this sober. I've never done this before. This is the best I can offer you. And yes, I'm a little edgy. I am a little edgy. <laughs> Forgive me if I've offended you. Four steps for everyone. But anyways, <laughs> without you, the space in between you and me, that beautiful recipe, the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I would have missed it all. Thank you for my life.